So we're just waiting for our um, first speaker to come, uh, who's Tom Round. Um, for those of you that I've not met, um, I'm Lucy, I'm a GP um, and I'm the North West London Primary Care Cancer Lead. Um, and just to let those that have already joined know that this is being recorded, so the re recording has already started. Um, and for questions, um, if you wouldn't mind putting those in the chat, and we will keep an eye on those throughout the presentation and there'll, there'll be plenty of time for discussion and questions at the end. So hopefully it'll be a fairly interactive session. Sophie, do you know if Tom's here yet? I think he's having just some problems getting on, so let me, I'll, I'll chase that. Just bear with us one moment and then we'll get cracking. Thank you to those that are still arriving. We're just getting our first speaker um, logged on. I think there's just been a couple of connection problems. So if you wouldn't mind just holding for a moment um, and then we'll get started as soon as we can. For, for those of you that are still joining us, we do apologise for the slight delay. We're just waiting for uh, Dr. Tom Round to join. He's just having some issues logging in and, 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 and Lucy Hollingworth has already come on. But for those who've come on since she's explained it, we'll be with you very shortly. So thank you for your patience. Um, we have asked everyone to get put their cameras off and remain on mute. And then if you can put questions in the chat box as the talk goes along, we'll then come to that in the discussion time at the end. So hopefully we'll have the, the opportunity to answer any questions that you have and we'll hopefully get going very soon. Um, I do apologise, I think a few of us um, who don't normally work in North London have been having some issues with accessing the Teams link, but we'll be with you very, very shortly. Thank you. Lucy, do you maybe want to go to the rapid diagnostic centre bit? Um, I think Tom, who was going to present the first bit, is just having a little bit of trouble. So we'll just turn the yep. presentation on its head if that's OK. That's fine with me. Yep. So, um, Sophie, are you able to move the slides along to the section on the, the acceptance and RDCs, please? All right. Yep. Perfect. All right. So this is going to be the second part of the presentation, but just whilst uh, Tom is having difficulty getting in, as Lucy says, it may be worthwhile us getting started on the, the second part so as to not delay any further because we appreciate that everyone is very busy and probably has lots of stuff that they need to do otherwise. So just as an introduction, um, I am Lucy Snedden. I am the 
RMP Southwest London Clinical Director for Cancer and Primary Care. Um, I work as a GP in Wandsworth and I am also um, I also work in we call it the ADOC, so the Acute Diagnostic Oncology Clinic at Chelsea and Westminster, which is the equivalent of the RDC. Um, so we can we can talk through this. Tom, I can see you've just made it on. We've decided just to flip the presentation, if that's all right. But I'll introduce you. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, everyone. So hopefully quite a few people on the call have had some form of experience of referring to rapid diagnostic centres. And it'll be useful maybe in the discussion just to find out any, any feedback from that point of view. But so an RDC, just for those of you experience, it's essentially centres that are across the, the, the NHS, which are there to try and diagnose or hopefully exclude cancer in patients that have more non-specific symptoms but are still concerning that they could be cancer, um, and specifically those that don't fit into another tumour-specific uh, pathway. In general, um, we would aim to see people within 14 days, but obviously with the changes um, in terms of the fast diagnosis standard and cancer waiting times, it may not certainly be 20, 14 days, but we'd be aiming to get people referred to diagnosis within 28 days. So we're still, you know, kept to the same the same terms. Patients that we can see have to be over 18, and they have to have symptoms, so clinical symptoms which are concerning of cancer, or if there's any sort of abnormal imaging that they can't necessarily go down a tumor-specific pathway. We also accept that same as if people have blood results which are, are coupled with concerning symptoms which could be related to cancer, we could also see those. The key thing is that they, they would be people that wouldn't meet the other tumour pathways. So if someone, for example, has a positive fit test, we wouldn't expect them to be coming to us. We'd expect them to be going down the lower GI pathway. People need to be well enough to come to the clinic. And it's really, really important to make sure these patients are aware that the referral is because of a concern of cancer. So we need to be really explicit about that. On to the next slide. Thank you. So this map is just for, for reference. I won't go through it in much detail, but this just gives you an idea of the but a lot of them are open to, to any areas. So it's just worthwhile looking at that, um, just in terms of if you're not sure of where your local RDC sites are. On to the next slide, please. So this, again, hopefully a lot of you are familiar with this. So this is our non-site specific uh, referral form. So it's really, really important to make sure that you fill in the reason for referral and do give us some information because we appreciate that the symptoms are vague. So it's really helpful to put a decent level of detail in there so that we're aware of what the concerns are um, and, and what we should be really kind of focusing on when we're, when we're taking the history and examining the patients. We've got a list of filter function tests, which we want to have done before people come in. Now, that is also just to give us a kind of baseline so that we can compare that to any tests that we do. But with the Sorry, I think, did I cut out for a second? Yeah, you cut out, you cut out a little bit. Yes, yeah, sorry, you just cut out for a second. Okay. Then. I wasn't sure if it's so just yeah, me. Just, but... just, just explaining that obviously the filter function tests um, for things like fit and chest x-ray is just to make sure that people shouldn't be going down a site-specific pathway. So it's, it's just really important to try and get those tests done. And if for any reason you're not able to get the patients to complete those tests, which I do appreciate sometimes can be difficult with certain patients or with certain you know, tests such as the FIT test, please do justify the reason for that in our referral form or email the site just to make us aware so we're aware of why that's not being done. Um, if we go on to the next slide, it will just tell you about how you can actually physically do it so we won't spend much time on this because I'd, I'd hope that a lot of you are aware or if you're not doing your own e-referrals directly I'm sure your, your your secretaries and admin staff will be aware, aware of how to do it but it still comes under the drop down for two week wait you obviously spit this, uh, select the specific trust that you're referring to and it's the non-specific non symptoms pathway that our 
referrals will go down to. Um, we strangely seem to at Chelsea get quite a lot of ophthalmology referrals, so just make sure that you are after the, on the oncology side of things. If we go on to the next slide, please. So I'm not going to talk through the next slides. We will be sharing these slides after the presentation, but it just has the different sites that we've got across West London in terms of the days that they run, where the services are, and also any key contacts there. Just useful for you to have an awareness of, of who you can contact if there's any issues, or if you are ever interested in kind of considering looking at the rapid diagnostic uh, clinic as something you'd be interested in, I'm sure lots of us would be happy for you to be in contact with us just to ask for any, any further um, advice in terms of how to get into it. We're going to do a couple of um, uh, case studies. I think there was a hand that went up just now. Um, just if we can put questions in the chat box, we'll come to them at the end if that's okay when we have the discussion part, which will hopefully be you know half of the half of the webinar so I was going to run through a couple of case studies which are patients that I've seen in recent months at Chelsea and Westminster so just to give you a kind of a, a flavour of what we might see in RDC so here's the first one so this was an 86 year old female she was referred to us at Chelsea after the GP had arranged an ultrasound scan which showed multiple echogenic hepatic lesions. Now on the radiology report, they had suggested that differentials could include uh, sarcoid deposits, granulomas, but also metastases. The patient did already have a hep hepatology appointment booked at Imperial in a month's time. Um, so the patient came in with her, with her daughter. And so we went into a bit more detail about what she was actually experiencing. So she was complaining of some right sided back ache and flank pain. She did have some nausea and some vomiting at times. She had a quite a marked reduction in her appetite and did feel full very quickly. She didn't have any bowel symptoms otherwise, and there were no other real specific symptoms, feeling tired, but not necessarily more than usual. In terms of her past medical history, she had a background diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, CKD, and she also had a background of sarcoidosis, which had been diagnosed 30 years earlier, um, kind of an incidental finding essentially on a, a brain CT um, for another reason, and that was how she was diagnosed and had, didn't have any ongoing rheumatology input from that point of view. She's on a few different medications that I've listed, so amlodipine, atorvastat, and metformin, and ranopril. Had never been a smoker and very rarely drank alcohol. On examination, um, so ECOG is to do with their performance status. It's sort of performance status of one to two when we first saw her. She didn't appear obviously sort of pale or jaundiced at the time. Her tummy was soft, but she certainly had a very enlarged liver that was palpable a good three fingers below her rib cage um, and but there was no other obvious splenomegaly or other masses that we could feel and she didn't have any significantly enlarged lymph nodes so we're going to do a bit of a poll so uh, if you can help in terms of activating the poll that'd be really helpful but the question is what would you do next so number one would you try to expedite her hepatology review so as I say that was in a month's time um, would you, oh, I'm just going to move that out the way somehow, I can't see my, sorry, I can't see my things because this is coming away, there we go. Um, would you redirect this patient to A&E? Would you refer her to the upper GI suspected uh, cancer pathway? Would you order bloods and do a CT chest, abdomen and pelvis? Or would you refer to rheumatology for a sarcoidosis review? So if I give you um, a, a minute to put in some some responses that would be really helpful yes. and we'll see what the full results are. Just, keep in mind, the just while people um, are doing the poll in a moment, can yeah. everyone just make, make sure that they're on mute because we're getting some feedback. Uh, yeah. There is, if we... Sorry, my internet is poor. Um, I'm not sure if we can get the, the poll results up. Let's have a look. Tom, are you able to see the poll? It's results? in the chat. 
It's ah, in, the in the chat. OK, sorry, I'm looking in the poll. So rather I'm, than I'm, the chat. I'm, I'm having a go at doing the poll, but it's asking the both questions before I can submit. I don't know if anyone else has something left. So we oh, might need okay. to do but might do the second question as well, and then we can submit and get well, the answers. The second question is for the next next ah. patient, so we'll maybe just leave it. The poll has been a, a, a technological step too far. So okay. anyway, if we can go on to the next slide, then um, I'll discuss what we found. So when we arranged bloods for the patient, her her full blood count was was actually reassuringly normal at that point, um, including normal platelets, white cell counts were normal. However, her inflammatory markers were raised. So her ES, ESR was 77, CRP 9.9, the EGFR was 36, which isn't great, but she had got a background of CKD and it wasn't far off her baseline. But her liver function tests, as you can see, that I've highlighted, were all very, very deranged. And on looking back after we'd had the referral, we could see that they had been deranged for, for several months before the ultrasound referral and the subsequent referral to us had been sent. Her albumin at our initial meeting was um, 31, um, and we did a few. Sorry, forgive me, my internet. Her protein electrophoresis was negative. I've outlined her CT findings, but essentially she had multiple new round masses in both of her lungs. She had a lot of lymph nodes in the mediastinum, but the radiologist felt that those were probably in keeping with sarcoidosis. And her liver, most significantly, was grossly enlarged um, and it was displacing the portal vein and causing significant hepatomegaly, which was also actually displacing the bowel as a result of the size. And she had multiple um, lymph nodes also in, in her abdomen below the diaphragm level. So the radiological opinion was that it was most suggestive of a, a metastatic disease, but an unknown primary, most likely liver. But that, that was obviously all that they could tell from the, the CT. We move on to the next slide, please. So, yeah, so at that point, we discussed her with interventional radiology at Chelsea, who felt that because of the size of the liver and the proximity to the abdominal wall, that actually. On her comorbidities, her performance status, and we'd, we'd repeated her bloods not soon, not long after we'd seen her because of her liver of uh, liver impairment, um, and those continued to worsen. And her low, her albumin reduced to, down to 25 within within a short period of time. I had a really difficult discussion with the patient and the family. She came along with three family members, so her son and daughter, and also a niece that she was close to, to discuss what we should do next, um, and had to kind of explain that we felt that perhaps it, it might be okay not to do anything in terms of investigating further just because it might not make a difference to what, what she would be offered in terms of treatments but obviously that we would support them regards of the decision. It was quite difficult because I felt that the patient probably didn't want to have a biopsy but the family were very keen to know either way so we agreed that we would request the, the, the biopsy but unfortunately the patient became more unwell and ended up being admitted as an inpatient to the hospital and at that point it was agreed that actually the biopsy it was it was it wasn't going to, to to change change things and if anything was going to put her at more risk than than give her any benefits so she was then seen by our palliative care team at Chelsea um, and sadly ended up passing away within a month of the referral to us so not the best outcome in terms of what happened to the patient but just you know an idea of the complexities of some of the cases that we see um, and some some learning points that we can maybe discuss if we've got time afterwards um, Tom I'm just conscious that we've flipped things are you still okay time wise or do you need me to skip over the next case and move on to you uh, maybe just briefly if you wanted to just overview that maybe yeah. like okay, so we'll just three or four minutes a second case but we're just conscious of time because it took us a bit longer to get started so this one's just a slightly different case um with thankfully a, a happier ending and um, so this is a 76 year old man that we saw and so he was referred into his g by his gp for what they termed as overwhelming fatigue 
he'd had about one and a half stones of uh, weight loss that couldn't really be explained in the last sort of six weeks, and also generalised aches and pains across his body. He'd been someone that was very fit and active before, was always independent in his activities of daily living, didn't really have any significant past medical problems in, you know, before that. And in the six weeks prior to us seeing him, you know, it got to the point where he was struggling to get dressed or bathed without the assistance of his wife. He felt quite significant sort of reduction in particular in movements of his shoulders just because of the pains and just felt sort of general malaise, but no other real specific symptoms that we identified on our systems inquiry. He didn't have any preceding viral illness, including COVID before that, and no sort of foreign travel and no significant family history. When we examined him, he did look quite thin and did, did look quite pale. Um, he did have a couple of palpable lymph nodes, um, one in his left axilla and another one in his groin. And I noted that he had quite a lot of difficulty just getting on and off the bed um, when we examined him. So I've got another poll, but we might just let people put some answers in the chat box just to, so I can have a little look at uh, what the responses are. So what would you do next in this case? And there may be more than one right answer in this case, um, just as a bit of a just being cheeky. So would you order bloods in a CT scan? Would you arrange an ultrasound of the groin and axilla? Would you refer to neuro neurology, refer to haematology or refer to rheumatology? And as I say, there, there may be more than one correct answer. So we give you a quick minute just to go through that. And hopefully some people can put some answers in the chat box. That would be really good. So we've got a couple of people putting in number one already. If we can get some number one and two from someone, yeah. Let's see. Two, and some people are also bringing in number five as well. So those are all very good suggestions. If we move to the next slide, please. Yeah, so when we did his bloods, he had a new normocytic anemia, um, also alongside some slightly raised white cell counts and neutrophils as well. He had a new thrombocytosis with his platelets at 549. His CRP and his ESR were both very raised above 80. He did also have a raised ferritin, but his iron binding studies were normal otherwise, and his hematinics were fine otherwise. His kidney function was stable, except for a, a slightly low sodium at 131, um, and his liver function was okay with, aside from a slightly raised alkalos. Um, we did do his ultrasound of his, and his, of his groin and his axilla, so not option two would be correct, um, and that just showed some, some non-concerning lymph nodes. And then his CT scan was actually reassuring with the exception of um, a 12 millimeter pancreatic cyst, which was later discussed in the upper GI meeting, um, in the MDT meeting. So it may be just a quick uh, 30 seconds, if people could just put in the chat box, what do they think the potential diagnosis would be, just to see what your thoughts are. Yeah. Wonderful. Good. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, everyone on the same uh, same track and well done to Maria who put it in even when we we're asking the first question. So Maria, put it very well done. If we go on to the next slide, please. Yeah, so we arranged actually at the first at the point of first review because we were so convinced this was PMR, we actually asked rheumatology in the hospital if they could review him and they were in agreement with him. We agreed that we would send him for a PET CT just to make sure that there wasn't any other evidence of disseminated malignancy that hadn't been shown on the, the CT scan before we started steroid treatment. And the PET was suggestive of PM, PMR and no suggestion of malignancy. Um, he was put on a reducing course of prednisolone and actually within a couple of weeks of starting the steroids, he felt almost back to baseline and his CRP and ESR had come back down. With regards to the cyst that was found on the CT, they thought it was most likely an IPMN, so an introductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, which is benign, um, but as it, and they didn't think that it was causing any symptoms, so he was just going to be routinely followed up by gastroenterology with regards to ongoing surveillance of that cyst because of the potential risk of it becoming cancerous. So if we go on to the next slide that I'll quickly 
gloss over. So those were just a couple of examples of some, some patients that we'll see. So I've already mentioned some of it, but just some key messages. Just make sure that you are providing us with enough clinical information in the referral form. It's really, really helpful. If weight loss is the referral uh, reason, which most of our referrals are unexplained weight loss, um, do make sure that you give us some idea of what their weights were before and after, or if they don't know what their weight is because they don't have scales, just give us a kind of clothing size change, belt buckles, just some sort of idea of what it is. Um, again, if the referral is mainly related to abnormal imaging or blood results, just put them in the clinical information box because it's much easier for us to see them there rather than having to go to the bottom of the referral to see them amongst everything else. And sometimes if you're referring to a hospital that your bloods don't go to, we can't always see those on our system. Do consider their performance status and frailty before referring, because if they are housebound or bedbound, is it useful to look for cancer? And I know that can be a difficult conversation to have in your 10 minute GP appointments, but just really helpful for us to make sure that that's being considered. Please always, for the sake of our nurses who do the triaging, please always make sure that the bypass number is in there. It just saves a lot of time so that they can contact Chase Up Fit Test to let you know any updates. It's really helpful rather than being 30th in the queue waiting to get through, which is understandable. Please do do the filter function test. And as I say, if for any reason you can't get part of it done, just let us know um, um, and, and just justify that so we're aware because we can't request fit tests, for example, from secondary care. And probably the most important thing is do let them know that this is a cancer referral. Otherwise, they get a, a clinic letter that says cancer or oncology and they get very panicky um, and they come to us terrified that they think they've already got cancer. And just try not to tell patients what investigation they're having because it might actually vary from what we decide is relevant. So very quick overview. Um, and I'm going to hand on to, uh, to Tom just now. Thank you, Lucy. Possibly, if you're concerned, please do just get in touch with us. Our contact is on the different um, slides with the different RDCs. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with us to ask for any, any advice or anything else you need to speak to us about. Thank you. And over to you, Tom. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Waiting. And sorry for the slight IT problems we had earlier on. And I think, Lucy, that was a really good um, overview of how actually using RDCs, we can potentially pick up serious diagnoses, not just cancer as well. Um, just as a brief introduction, I'm Thomas Round. I'm an academic GP at King's College. I'm also the RM Partners Research and Implementation Lead. Um, we're just going to give a brief overview of some of the changes that you might have heard of. So that was kind of in the news a little bit recently. It was around some changes to these fast diagnostic standards. I would just reassure people there's no uh, fundamental change to how we refer patients in. It's more uh, for a hospital measure that they're not counting the two week weight as a performance target or metric. Uh, the main target is this fast diagnostic standard. Um, so in a way, there's no change for how we refer patients in, but we might change how we might term it. So I would say moving away from, say, a two week wait to more we're doing an urgent referral or, an ur or a urgent suspected cancer referral. I think that's an important debate as well as we're, we, we're having about um, should urgent referrals be used for other serious pathology and maybe yes. So uh, Lucy gave that example of the RDC pathway picking up serious pathology. Um, the, the, the current looking at RDC rates that about 8 to 10 percent of patients referred have cancer, but about 30 to 40 percent will have serious pathology. So that's, you know, cancer in the context of serious pathology. Next slide, please. Uh, and then. Again, we might be aware of the primary care network DES. So partly what we'll be doing today is having a think about our, um, we're looking at non-specific pathways, so that's the RDCs. Also thinking about referral practice, looking at disadvantaged groups, embedding fit testing and the specific areas around prostate uh, and screening as well. But the key area we're looking at today is that number one. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. And partly you can um, have that as part of your um, documentation as well coming to this webinar. And as I say it will be recorded and slides will be circulated uh, for wider practice teams. As we know, not everyone can attend today and we'll be having future follow up dates as well. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so just a little brief overview there, and that's saying uh, you can see there about how there's been a change over time in our relative survival, uh, but the UK and Denmark are outliers, and and this is a little bit old data now. We've had a similar piece of work which shows there's that similar difference. So maybe higher, similar high income countries like Sweden and Australia do a bit better for cancer, and complex reasons why that could be it could be around patient factors. 
clinician, primary care factors and system factors. So I think really the important thing to say here is to take them all in, in, in that context. Um, and around 55% of patients are diagnosed at early stage. So by that, I mean stage one and two. So the ultimate aim is to get early stage diagnosis for, for, for symptomatic patients. Next step, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I've been around a fair amount of time and I, I remember this previous iteration of the NICE Cancer Guidelines 2005 that was mainly based on red flag symptoms and their predictive value was made PPV or predictive value of cancer was around 5 to 10%. Um, and But obviously we had a lot of primary care research in this area led by Willie Hamilton and other colleagues and that was really looking at combinations of symptoms, blood tests, so thrombocytosis we mentioned, uh, unexplained anemia, combinations of maybe vaguer symptoms and that led to the 2015 updated guidance which really talked also not just about red flags but also combinations of symptoms however it is a very complicated world we're we're, we're living in if you go to the press the next slide that just gives a one page overview of some of the symptoms that could be linked to different cancers so we all know this in primary care just how complicated this is this is the bmj trying to summarize some of the nice cancer guidelines it just shows how complicated different symptoms and signals can be for different cancer types uh, but i guess the key thing from from that ni a nice update was lowering the threshold you know thinking about maybe not just red flags five to ten percent predictive value of cancer, but it embedded that 3% threshold. And there's a lot of debate about that, whether that's been economically modeled, but really it gives, it, it, it's an enabling guideline for us as GPs to think also about gut feeling, combinations of symptoms and when to refer. And that this has led to a big increase in utilization of these referral pathways. Next slide, please. So what this slide does is show some variation in the use of previous two week wait. We're now going to call it urgent cancer referrals. Um, and this is looking each one of those little dots is a practice. Uh, six, seven thousand practices in England, and it's showing that on the bottom axis is standardized referral. So that's a, uh, and that is a fully available data. And it's looking at the number of referrals you make for a time period and standardizing based on your practice list, for example, age. So that's the biggest driver. So obviously, if you had quite a young population, you would probably do less urgent referrals than an older population. So we, we have a standardized measure there that we can then look at how uh, differences between practices. And then on the left axis there, you've got to take rate what that means is the proportion of your cancers for that time period it could be one year it could be five years how many of the total cancers for your practice were picked up following urgent referral so you can see there it's correlated so the more referral you do probably you do pick up more cancers but there um, but there's a lot of variation as well so we use that basis then to explore further research so i've done a number of research studies looking at okay so if there is this variation does it make any difference that's the key thing does it make any difference to patient outcomes so we go to the next slide please i'll just do this very briefly but then um we did publish we we had a bmj article then i had some follow-up papers in British Journal of General Practice and that really did show that if you are a patient from a higher referring high detector practice uh, you will have improved outcomes so uh, improved survival but also a stage shift so we did find a increased stage one and two cancers um, for overall and for most can most of the main cancer types other than colorectal so that might be actually that we need to use more fit testing in primary care for colorectal referrals um, and we did show that there was a little bit of variation based on some of the practice indicators. For example, um, if you have an older population, you might do more referral. Um, if you have generally, we found also if you are a practice with slightly younger GPs, you might also do more referral practice and more, more detection. So really just investigating some of the reasons for that variation. But the key take home message here is that overall, the direction of travel is a positive one more referral and more detection at primary care level means probably less patients picked up via emergency route and probably a little bit of stage shift and improved improved outcomes for patients. Uh, next slide please. Uh, and this just shows what ha has happened over the past 10 years so referrals have more than doubled so this was up to pre-pandemic data showing 2.3 million referrals. Uh, you can see there their conversion rate. So that in a way is a bit like the PPV I talked about. So NICE talked about this 3% risk threshold. We've gone from about one in 10 referrals to having cancer to about six to seven in a hundred. So I do use that actually when I do a referral, I say there's enough risk. I need to think about this urgent referral. 
the chances are you probably haven't got cancer. There could be some other serious pathology going on, but you know that chance is enough that we probably need to do some referral. And then obviously we're very used to having that discussion, looking at the frailty of the individual. Is it worth having an urgent referral or not, depending on their comorbidities, and having that shared decision making really about what where they'd like to ha have tests. But uh, and, and on the bottom row there, you can see how we have improved detection. So that's a number of cancers being detected via this pathway. Uh, next slide, please. And this slightly complex slide, but it just shows that primary care is responsible for the majority of, of cancer cases diagnosed. So around 7% of cancers are in England are diagnosed following screening, but the vast majority are picked up following GP referral. So that's either urgent referral, uh, that's as over 50%, routine referral, and then there's that proportion with emergency presentation. Now, emergency presentation is complicated. It's a uh, patient having any kind of A&E emergency activity. It's not like the press would say diagnosed in A&E. It just means for whatever reason they might have a GI bleed. It might be appropriate that have an emergency presentation. The key thing there is thinking about reducing those if we can. Um, potentially inappropriate emergency presentations. And we have done a, a big inroads to that. So if I presented this data five or more years ago, it would be about 25% emergency presentation. This is now dropped to 17% emergency presentation. So overall, it's a, a positive direction of travel, thanks to primary care doing more referral and testing. Um, I should just say, linking to Lucy's talk, about 50% of cancer patients will have a cancer specific signature, but the other half will have non-specific symptoms. So that's why it's really important that we're having the RDC rollout and utilization. There's good evidence base from Denmark who have a similar healthcare system to us about having these serious pathology RDC type um, centers where when patients have weight loss or other vague symptoms, we can refer for testing. Uh, next, next slide, please. And Again, it's positive news story. So we can see that pandemic drop in uh, this is rapid registration data showing number of patients diagnosed at stage one and two. So um, with all this extra activity, we are seeing incremental increases. So when that previous slide said it was about 50, 55 percent, it's now got up to 57 percent. We're showing continued increases in early stage diagnosis, but it, it it's requiring a lot of work. That's the key thing. So what we're saying is not just do more referrals, but think about and you know with an aging population we are going to have to do more cancer testing we know that predicted uh, numbers of cancer cases are probably going to go, go up to about half a million but we also have to think about an evidence using evidence for deciding when to refer for example breast pain we don't need to refer to a two-week wait if it's just breast pain no breast lump using fit testing probably doing more testing in primary care as well more chest x-rays more maybe a little bit more liberal approach to to testing and using rdc's for those vaguer symptoms Next slide, please. Uh, and this shows, uh, obviously, you might have heard that the UK target, we're looking to try and get 75% of people at stage one and two. We're having that baseline of 55%. And this is from CRUK, I've nabbed this slide, but really thinking about how we can get to that 75%. So that's screening. We're not going to we'll touch on that today, but that screening optimization, timely presentation from the public. So thinking about your patient groups, harder to reach groups, patients who are delaying, Maybe patients with certain um, black and ethnic minority populations, people with comorbidities, maybe at attending primary care quite a lot before, more than other patients before we maybe get to a cancer referral or diagnosis. Uh, and I've shown that that variation in referral guidance and compliance with referral, so we could make a bit of inroads there. And then also some innovations and pathway pathway availability. So really, it's an incremental process. We're making good steps towards that, but we continue to need to do more. Next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, thinking a little bit about that variation in our own healthcare environment, healthcare system. So some of you might have had a look at fingertips. That's just an example. It's quite a complicated data set to look at. We try to simplify it a bit. Um, uh, but obviously it, it just show that variation and, and you can compare your practice to practice in your PCN into your ICB. Um, the key thing, I think, when looking at any data is to look at maybe five years combined because we know there's a bit of year on significant year on year variation between practices, particularly when uh, you think cancer in primary care is re reasonably rare. So a full time GP might have eight cancers a year, but potentially hundreds of consultations that could be due to cancer. So particularly with 
with looking at this data and all data has caveats around looking at it, but looking at the five years combined is, is a good starting position. Uh, but we next slide, please. We did uh, working with Edge Health colleagues. We've created a local dashboard, which is and that's the link there. And again, these slides will be shared. That'll help you have a look at our um, local healthcare system. So that's looking at boroughs. There's a heat map there around cancer detection, but it's looking at other uh, figures there. You can have a look at uh, practices, how you com com how you compare to your neighbourhood practices, and how we might use this data to inform some changes to either assessment or looking at outreach for our population. Next slide, please. And then just very briefly, so thinking about all that sort of national level data, local data, we're then thinking about informing this primary care uh, cancer detection program. So that's really looking at that variation. We think the high detection rate generally the better, less emergency presentation, probably better outcomes. Though it is nuanced, I do appreciate that. No, no data is perfect. Um, then thinking about what potential patient, clinician and system factors might be affecting this. And really this is exploratory quality improvement and research with outreach to practices with Edge Health. So we've had a look at the um, looking at the low, maybe low detecting practices, looking at the high detecting practices, thinking about lessons learned, thinking about how we can um, think about, as I say, patient, clinician and system level factors. Next slide, please. And this gives a little overview. Some of you on this call might have been outreached from this program. So this is a, uh, as I say, it's a program of work looking uh, an iterative sort of program really to inform next steps going forward around primary care cancer detection. You can see there then uh, what a wide variation in, in practices across the boroughs in RM Partners area. We've had uh, overall 34 practices, but I think we're going to go up to 40, 45 practices. Uh, we'll have, uh, write a report around this, but then you can see the a difference in the detection rate. So the low detection about 38% up to 64%. So quite a big variation compared to the average detection rate. And probably you can you can see there that what's driving some of that difference is probably that utilization. So in our low detecting practices, they're using two week rate referral generally over that five years, 20% less than average, whilst our high detection practices are doing it 20% more. And that's not to say, as I say, that we just need to keep referring more and more. It's using those evidence-based criteria, which have been assessed by a lot of primary care research and evidence to help us pick up more cancers. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, this is some of the themes that we've had from the initial analysis. So thinking, as I say, about that population factors, collision practice factors and system level factors. Now, a lot of this isn't new, but it's really thinking about where do we go next with maybe some investment, thinking about population outreach, strategies to facilitate access and reduce health inequalities, thinking that what we can do as a practice or individual clinician. So thinking about our referral thresholds, what tools do we use, safety netting, our sort of workforce and actually top tips and, and, and attending webinars like this and, le and shared learning across the healthcare system. And then uh, the key thing at the end is about RDCs. We've, we've touched on quite a lot and that relationship with secondary care and access to diagnostic testing. OK, I think that's. That's me, I think. So thanks. Sorry. Thanks for listening. That's a little whistle stop tour from national level data to local level data. I was just going to signpost now to some resources and educational content. So this program of early detection, we're of course thinking about education and um, training as part of that. Some of you may have gone on the Red Whale training. There's some links there, um, so some top tips, some pearls around that. And that's, you know, thrombocytosis, blood test results, other things that you you can, quick, quick wins that you can bring into your practice using tumour markers, etc. CA125 as well, there's quite a lot of evidence base for that in using that in primary care now if you're thinking of ovarian cancer. So uh, next step, next slide. Uh, yeah, that's got the sign up link there. So I'd say that's if you use that code, you can get access to the content on demand from Red Whale and that's both for GPs and other allied healthcare professionals. So I think that's really good resource that has been funded till as until the end of next year. So a sort of takeaway message is if you're interested in cancer, please don't log on to that. We're really interested as, as well around the needs of the wider primary care team. So we know GP numbers keep on dropping. Sadly, there's not many of us. We need to be cherished and supported. But we've got these wider teams from um, uh, the ARS roles, primary care network. So thinking about the needs of pharmacists, physios, other people and picking up serious disease and pathology. And that's really important as well with education. Next slide. And this is just a flag, save the date, please. We're having a cancer 
education and outreach day that's on uh, Thursday 29th of February we'll send more information about that but that'll be really sharing the findings from this work and thank you for all the practices who have engaged with this primary care detection program and then thinking of next steps around that along with some education programs as well so thank you very much and I'll open floor up for, I think now for discussion time I think we got through reasonably on time and sorry for all the IT problems going on it's not Thank a webinar there's so some sort of IT problems um so I've just seen the first question from Atul Mehta thank you Atul so um work in Hillingdon and patients have a bit of a trek to the nearest RDC are there plans to open new RDCs I think in an ideal world, Hillingdon would eventually have one, but there's no plans at the moment. So at the moment, the agreement is for the bulk of Hillingdon patients to go to West Middlesex. Um, but um, we have discussed with the team at Northwick Park, and Northwick Park would also be happy um, to see patients, especially from the kind of Northwick Park side of Hillingdon, to be seen there. Um, but we'd obviously keep you updated in the future if there was to be an RDC opening at Hillingdon. So that's that's hopefully a helpful answer to your question, Atom. Lucy, you had a question for me probably about data, I think. To explain it again or is that or are you making a comment there about it i'll just go through that again so there's those three metrics that you can have a look at that um on the fingertips and we're using those in the edge health toolkit as well to look at the local data so um uh, as i say the detection rate is the that's the in a way that's sensitivity so that's like if that's for the um it's a percentage of all cancer cases which are being picked up following your referral at your practice. So uh, if an example, if your five year detection rate is 50% and you had 100 cancer cases for that five years, that would mean 50 of them were picked up following your referral. So, and, and we generally think the higher that rate is probably the better, but as I say, there's caveats around that about routes to diagnosis. So in some areas, if uh, you have a lot of patients going privately, that, that might skew the figures a little bit. So we've always got to just be mindful of, of, of the caveats on that. The conversion rate, that is the, like I said, like the predictive value of your referral. So of, of our referrals, how many will go on to get a diagnosis? So as I said, the previous red flags, five to 10%, we're now lowering that risk threshold a bit. And that just, you know, that's a challenge for the healthcare system and for secondary care. You know, we need to bring secondary care on along with that because we kind of slightly feel in primary care, we get damned if we do, damned if we don't. But I think that all the evidence is probably we've had historically a low, you know, if you look at the CT, MRI, endoscopy capacity for UK, it's one of the low it's probably the lowest in the OECD. You know, I give the example of Australia, lots of our friends probably have moved to Australia as GPs. Um, you can get a next day CT scan. They've got four or five times the amount of diagnostic capacity and they get really good outcomes. So you could argue, actually, we've already got a testing from healthcare systems that actually we do need a bit more, um, a bit more diagnostic capacity in an evidence-based way. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Beverly. Nice to see you again. Nigel just raised his hand. Nigel, have you got a question? Yeah, I'm just picking up on your comment about Australia and access to diagnostics. Um, one of our problems is that often we feel we want an investigation and uh, we don't want our consultant colleagues in our hospital settings kept busy filling out electronic forms doing a similar assessment to what we've been through. But our radiologists seem very reluctant sometimes to accept requests from us as GPs. Um, and that holds up the whole system. Um, we've we, we used Norfolk Park. Their, their rejection process can take two or three weeks, which just sort of like obviates the whole two-week wait um, interest. Um, their, their, their training seems to be sort of based on sort of medical school textbooks, which, which is great for medical school, school graduates, but experience as a diagnostician through, through postgraduate training and, and general career experience obviously gives a, a very different view of... Um, as you were saying, the, the non-specific and gut intuition, which which, which these are, are you, are you working at, at all with uh, radiologists um, to, to try and encourage them to uh, either come to primary care for a while and learn how to diagnose clinically, or or, or, or to be re re and responsive to the concerns of GPs with, with, with their clinical diagnoses? Do you want to take that, Lucy's? Both Lucy's. Yes, I'm happy to take that. I'm really pleased that you raised that, Nigel, because. When Thomas was talking about the um, the interviews that have been happening across Northwest London around cancer detection rate, 
direct access imaging and diagnostics has been a recurring theme in terms of its role um, for early diagnosis. What I would say um, is that this is very much a recognised need. Uh, certainly the NG12 uh, guidelines reference a lot of um, direct access diagnostics for primary care and this is being rolled out. It's quite a, it's a big programme of work in order to make sure that things like the appropriate safety nets are in situ um, before that can go live. Um, but that will certainly be getting rolled out incrementally probably over the next few months. Um, and interestingly, there's been some uh, national direct access clinical guidelines released, which is really helpful in terms of what a GP can expect from, a, from an urgent direct access referral. So, for instance, transparency of when we should be re receiving the report back. Um, so there's lots of work going on there, and I think the provision is going to be significantly increased over the next year or so. Um, and we'll make sure that communications are sent out to primary care as and when those, those bits are live. And can I just add an extra point to that, Nigel? It would be entirely appropriate where your level of concern is high enough for you to use the RDCs to get those sorts of that, that sort of imaging done in a speedy manner if, if you know if it's thing that you're constantly finding you're not being able to get you know referrals accepted in terms of for direct access diagnostics I think if you've got a concern about cancer and it's sufficient that would absolutely be something we'd be more than happy to be seeing in the rapid diagnostic clinics and, and also our concern I guess is not that there's a likelihood of cancer because as you're saying the target is less than five percent of all referrals should be cancer but when you think of it as a part of the differential diagnosis it, and a very real possibility that, that's when you need the imaging just to I think, yeah, yeah, and I think it, there's definitely this suspected cancer, urgent suspected cancer referral, but then there's this kind of group of low risk but not no risk, and therefore you need to do something active to exclude that. And I think that's where the direct access uh, diagnostics are going to be incredibly valuable, so that we're not missing missing cancers, um, and where primary care care clinicians will be enabled to do some of that directly. Um, so very much uh, a kind of area that is being worked on now in the background, but I appreciate that not all of that is necessarily translating into availability yet. Thank you. Good question. Any more questions? Feel free to put hands up if people want. I would just say, as I say, that I think the RDCs are great and we should have full national coverage, hopefully by next year. I know it's a bit patchy. You know, London's good, so we're like off, we're the first movers in this area. So we've got pretty much pretty much all of London covered now by IDCs and there's good data to support. So I said that PPV of referral is around eight to ten percent. If Lucy, that sounds about right with your figures. So that right, you could say like one in ten will have cancer, but maybe 30, 40 percent will have some other really interesting serious pathology. And of course, there's a, as I said, with the symptoms, you know, bleeding that could be irritable bowel, uh, um, IBD, it could be cancer, it could be other serious pathology. So I think we're kind of slowly getting secondary care to really change the narrative that from our point of view, it's serious pathology or not, cancer as part of that. So in a way, we're kind of slowly morphing it to an urgent referral pathway with cancer on that. But it's really important if people have other serious pathology, which could cause morbidity or mortality. Uh, yeah, so I think there was a question about Red up, Well update days. So uh, yeah, I think we're taking that on board. I say there's online content we will be having. We're commissioning some more um, educational package going into next year, which will also have some bite-sized learning because we know not everyone wants to do like a full day, but they might want to do more webinars, more 20 to 30 minute updates. Um, so yeah, we're going to take that on board definitely for, and probably more education events like this as well as interactive. Any other questions or we could wrap up? I don't think there's any more questions at the moment. I think just as a kind of final note, there's been quite a lot of community engagement going on, particularly over um, NWL and um, South West London. Uh, uh, there's some community engagement things planned. Uh, and certainly I think just being aware as clinicians, of course, when somebody presents, we've then got the responsibility of working out what we're going to do with somebody and are, are responsible for that referral interval. Uh, but there's many things that um, impact a patient's presentation. Um, and we know that certain groups of patients are marginalised and not referred as quickly as others. So I think um, certainly some of the, the community engagement really highlighted that actually, that we need to be aware of our own biases. I mean, they are system wide. It's nothing. We can't deny it. It's not 
primary care specific um, and just trying to be provide as personalised care as we can and that's a, a real uh, something that primary care deliver incredibly well so I think um, carry on doing that if you can I think it's really appreciated by different groups within your community and you'll know them very well uh, and certainly outreach to those that we know don't come forward that willingly um, can be a real game changer. Yeah, totally. So as I say, we, we we touched a little bit on that and some of the slides about the inequalities. So we know certain groups are maybe uh, less willing to come forward. So more worried about wasting doctor's time or maybe had a bad experience or mistrust. Uh, so we really have to think, you know, when we're looking about that cancer and getting to that 75 percent early stage, it's that, like I said, it's the patient bit. It's the screening bit, it's a symptomatic presentation. It's the bit we can do as clinicians, really thinking about when to do te evidence based testing. Uh, reviewing our data, so a top tip would be have a look at fingertips or our, please look at our edge health tool, have a look at your practice, be really engaged with that, thinking about getting involved if you get invite for the detection rate program, uh, so I'm going to share the findings, but really that's really good QI sort of project that will be a quick win for your primary care network DES. Um, and I say we're going to have more education programs, top tips on referrals and using using testing in primary care as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, unless there's any more questions, I think we can allow everybody four minutes back in their diaries. Um, right, so thank, thank you, everyone. For attending, yes, and, and thank you for your few minutes of patience at the beginning as we've got things sorted. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we'll um, see you again in the next few months. Yeah. And so the recording will be shared along with the slides pack as well. So that's all good information for you. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.